other than the story of Jesus, of course, Job's life and what happened to him is just unprecedented. Listen to this. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was seven thousand sheep, three thousand camels, five hundred yoke of oxen. That's a thousand oxen, by the way. For those of you who don't know. And five hundred she-asses and a very great household. So that this man was the greatest of all the men in the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sacrificed them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. And the Lord said unto Satan, Which cometh thou? Then Satan answered the Lord, and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord, and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. Put forth, but put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. The devil said, the only reason that Job loves you so much is because you're so good to him. You let him have a tough time, and he'll, he'll bail out. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. Here it comes, people. Brace yourself. You talk about bad news, brother. This guy didn't show up and say, I got good news and I got bad news. He come in and said, I got bad news, and it gets worse. He said, and there came a messenger of Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone am escaped, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he's telling this story about all those oxen that got killed and all those she asses that got killed and all the servants that was working them, the next man comes in, verse 16. While he was yet speaking, before he could get through telling him, somebody else walked in, waving their arms. Mr. Job, i got something to tell you. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Man, it's getting bad. That's a, that ain't, somebody might say, Lord in mercy, how can it get worse? Don't ever say that. Don't ever say such a thing because it can. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels, and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am alone, escaped alone to tell thee. That's bad, brother. He lost it all. But he really didn't. Do you know when you think that you, you think, you think you've lost everything, but you really hadn't? A preacher told me one time, he said, Preacher, he said, I used to complain about I ain't got nothing. All these other people got all this money and all these big houses. I used to complain. I said, I had this little old house out in the country and, and I ain't got but one vehicle and I ain't got three or four cars on a boat. He said, one night a spark got loose uh, between the fireplace and the flue and got down inside the, the, uh, the, the walls there, the, the sheetrock or whatever, and they woke up and the house was in flames. And he said, the only thing they had out there in that November weather with frost on the ground was their pajamas and bare feet. And that sucker burnt slapped to the ground everything he owned. He said, preacher, I didn't have nothing. He said, I quit saying that junk. Amen. Amen. He said, I had plenty when I was shifting around with a shovel through the ashes and the burnt up boards and the, and the metal from the roof and all that stuff. He said, I found pieces of pictures and pieces of things that my kids had made and pieces of their clothes and toys and parts of my stuff and lots of over 25 years of memories burnt up just in a matter of minutes. You got more than you think you do. I don't know who that's for, but take your medicine. Amen? It ain't that bad, brother. Look at this. Verse 18, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Here it comes. This is the final blow. Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking. 
wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. I'm not going to read all of this, but if you'll read on down in chapter number 2, the Bible said the devil went back to the Lord, and he said he'll curse you if you'll, if you'll touch his body. And he let him make him sick. And the Bible said he sat down in verse 8. He had balls from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And he went and sat, took a piece of pottery. He took a piece of broken vase or something and sat down in a pile of ashes and started scraping those balls into pus and blood and water run out of them sores on his body. And that's the only thing he had left to his name was a pile of ashes. That's what I'm preaching about this morning, a pile of ashes. What in the world? You think, why would a man go to a pile of ashes? Why? Why not run to the hospital? Or why not call 911? Why not go to your friends? Why not go see a neighbor? I want you to notice in verse 1, we see that Job was a pure man. Job was right with God. Job did not have this happen to him because he was a bad man. His friends showed up, and for about 30-some chapters, uh, they chide him and they rebuke him and tell him, if you hadn't been doing wrong, no, this would happen. That ain't true, brother. Don't think because something bad happens to you, it's because you sin. That's absolutely not the truth because we preached on it last week. Lazarus died and it was the perfect will of God for him to lay in the grave. Bad things happen for good people for a reason. Job was a pure man. Verse 2 and 3, Job was a prosperous man. Job had, I mean, brother, he had everything anybody could want. I mean, brother, listen, he wasn't, he, he didn't have this happen to him because he was broke and he wouldn't work. Job was a pure man and he was a prosperous man. Job was healthy. Job had a good family. I believe he had a good wife. He had wonderful kids and he had all the substance a man could possibly want. Verse 4 and 5 tells us that he was a praying man. Amen? Job didn't have this happen to him because his back slid. Job didn't have this happen to him because uh, he had missed church or because, or because, he was, uh, because he quit paying his tithes. Job was a praying man. He was a righteous man. He was right with God. And God was proud of him. God pointed him out. And God chose him out of all the men in the earth, the Bible said. My next point is... In my introduction, he was a preferred man. Verses 6 through 8, God said, What do you think about Job? Check him out. Wouldn't you like to think the Lord's up in heaven and He picked you out and say, I have an example for you. I want you to live like this man right here. I'd like for you to follow the pattern of this, of this, uh, of my servant, Brother Sam, or my servant Jeff, or my servant Heath, or my servant Ronnie. This is how I like people to live. That's a good example. He's the prototype. That's the way I want Christians to live. Wouldn't you like to think God's up in heaven and He looked down and said, oh, Boys, you young men, you young preachers, I'd like for you to be like this preacher right here. I want you to live the way he lives and do like he does. I'm not putting nobody on pedestal. I'm just saying what an honor it was to be preferred for God Himself uh, to look down and say, I'm proud of Him. I tell you, brother, the greatest thing that my daddy ever said to me was when he said, Son, I'm proud of you. I remember when my daddy got old. He, those type of people, they wouldn't say, I love you. And Wilcoxes were weird people, brother. And from up there in the hills, they wouldn't even tell their wife they loved him. I mean, they wouldn't even shake hands till the honeymoon. Amen. Amen. They wouldn't tell each other they loved you until the third anniversary. But my daddy told me one time, he said, Son, I want to tell you one thing. He said, I'm sure proud of you. I thought in God's name for what? He said, for being such a preacher and taking a stand and giving your life to God. He said, I'm proud of you, son. Oh, brother, I want you to know what an honor it is to be a preferred man this morning. In verses 9 through 12, we see that he's a proven man. Amen? He lost his substance. We see in verses 14 through 17, Job lost everything. It ain't the end of the world, though. 
I've known people lost everything. As I mentioned that preacher a while ago, I've known people that had a lot of money and lose it all in a business deal. I mean, I've known people. I, I've heard of it. I've read about it. I've known people personally that was up here one day and a few months later, a few years later down here. But it's still not the end of the world. As we talked about in Sunday school, substance is just substance. Things are just things. Kids don't get too hung up on new cars and new trucks and boats and motorcycles and four-wheelers. And they ain't nothing wrong with having any of those things. There's not a sin. It's not wrong. But don't just get your life set on that stuff because it'll rot. It'll fade. It'll fall away. Listen, you can take a beautiful house and you can move out of it and go back in six months and it'll look like a ghost town. It dies when there ain't people in it. That's the truth, brother. Your substance, it'll fade. How many of you here know what I'm talking about? There's been times you've had money and there's times you ain't got two nickels rubbed together. About everybody here, I guarantee you. There's times I got money, brother Sam. I can trade cars and buy an old car, fix it up, put a little money. And then there's times I go for several months. I don't even know what in the world's going on. I ain't got two nickels rubbed together and have to live on fried rabbit tracks. But it ain't the end of the world, brother. That ain't my hope. The substance. He lost his substance. Verse 15 through 17. He lost his servants. He lost, I mean, he lost the people that worked for him. I mean, brother, he lost everything he had. And the people that's working for him, he lost them too. They even got killed. Now think about them people. You talk about the innocent dying. Them people didn't do nothing wrong. God turned the devil loose on Job. And all the innocent people got killed too. Where's the justice in that? I'll tell you where it's at. God is sovereign and right in everything He does. Verse 19, we see, I think, the worst part of this whole story as a daddy. If you're not a daddy this morning or a mama, you can't relate to what I'm saying. That's the worst part of this story, Brother Sam. The worst part, Brother Kevin, is when that man come in there and he said, Mr. Job... He said, I just wait a minute, I can't take much more. These people tell me they, uh, that, that they, they've come and they, the lightning's come and burned up the sheep or fire fell down. That's all hard to believe. And, and that my enemies have come and killed my servants and stole my camels and all those asses I had. The other guy standing there like this and he's shaking his head and he said, now what could you possibly hear? And he said, Mr. Joe, this is, it's really bad news. Well, well tell me. And he's, he might have said, I don't know how to tell you. I don't know how to break it to you. I want to tell you something, brother, if you ever had to tell somebody that their loved one has died. Brother, you think you've done something hard? I've had to do that a handful of times in my life. It ain't easy. I had to sit and tell my daddy that his baby girl was, had died and left this world. And brother, I couldn't do it. That's hard to do. He started looking around in his Alzheimer's and dementia and he started adding up his kids and there's one of them missing. And I had to scoot up to his wheelchair and put my arm around him and say, Daddy, she passed. She went on to be with the Lord. And he just screamed his kind of collapsing big old tears right down his face. I'm going to tell you something, brother. This servant come up and said, Mr. Job, he said, not only you lost everything, but your sons and your daughters, they're all killed. None of them survived. They're all gone. This man had a world of hurt come his way. To add insult to injury, he lost his substance, his service, his sons and daughters. But chapter 2, 1 through 8, he lost his strength and his health. I mean, not only did he lost everything, but he his health was gone. He couldn't even rebuild. If you're young and healthy, you lose it all. You can always rebuild, can't you, Brother Jeff? You can always start over. You can always go get another job. Hey, brother, if, your wife, if God takes your wife and you're 30 years old, you can go get another one. Hey, man, brother, I'm telling you, you can start over. But Job lost his health. He didn't even have strength. All he could do is crawl up into a pile of ashes and sit there and weep and cry and think of those memories and scrape those sores and those balls on his body. Lost his kids. Think about that. Y'all heard me preach on it. I ain't going to labor this point a whole lot, but every time I read that, I think about Job going down to the funeral home and having to pick out seven suits and three dresses, not to mention probably a bunch of grandkid clothes. I believe as adult, there's adult men said their houses, the eldest brother's house. Usually when a man moved out, he gets married and moves out. The Bible didn't say that. There could have been a bunch of grandkids got, got wiped out in that whole thing with that east wind come, move the house down. So Job may have had uh, ten sons and daughters and daughter-in-laws and sons-in-law and grandbabies and all that. I mean, every one of them's dead. And he had to dress them all up and pick out caskets and then he had the money to pay for it. Amen. Y'all are kind of quiet. You act like you ain't ready for preaching, but I'm ready to preach. He lost his strength and his health. 
Verse 9 through 13, he lost his supporters. That's, he lost his wealth, lost his health, lost his servants, lost his money, lost his kids. And on top of that, he didn't have a support group. Nowadays, you stump your toe, and you can go to the local stump toe support group and walk in and say, Hi, my name's Ron. I have a stump toe. Bless your heart, Ron. They'll all hug you. But it wasn't like that. Job didn't have nobody. He didn't have any supporters. The Bible said when his friends showed up, they sat down for seven days and seven nights and never uttered a word. Not only that, but his supporters, among those supporters, was his wife. Brother Les, I hope and pray to God, my wife's been my greatest supporter in my lifetime. Brother, I hope and pray that she stays true to the end. But brother, what if you lost everything? Lost your home, lost your money, lost your kids, lost your health, and on top of that, your wife walks out on you. You keep saying it can't get no worse, but it keeps getting worse. But why? Where did he? Where did those ashes come from? Well, here's my message. I had a long introduction. I'll preach a short message. Those ashes, the reason he sat down in a pile of ashes, that wasn't where they cleaned out the fireplace. That wasn't where they sifted through the wood stove and took the ashes and pitched them out in the backyard. Those ashes was a place where they had had an altar. And Job, uh, Job had gone out there and offered sacrifices and burned those bullocks and those lambs and those animals and sacrificed to the Lord. It was a place of worship and burnt offerings. It was a place, place of fellowship with God. Here's what I'm saying this morning. When you come to the end of the road and you, uh, the whole world caves in and everything crashes in, your wife, a life turns upside down and the unthinkable happens. Or maybe you think the unthinkable. And as I already said, sometimes it ain't bad as what we think. Listen, brother, you better find those pile of ashes and get in them. Listen, it might not be ashes, but that symbolizes something. That means Job went back to the place where he knew he could get some help. Never understood why people have a hard time. There's something bad happening now. Quit church. Job knew where to go to get help. He said, I'm going to go over here and sit down in these ashes because he remembered some things. Number one, it was a place of remorse. It was a place of remorse. The Bible said there in Job chapter 3, if you read on a little further in that story, and also in chapter 7, he talks about his suffering. And he said his suffering has no end. It's a place of remorse. You know one of the first things Job said when he sat down in the ashes and that blood and all that pus was running and he had the memory of his kids and his, uh, all, everything and he just lost. You know what? He said, I cursed the day I was born. He said it would have been better if somebody said there was a man child born but he was, he was born without life or he was still born. He said, here's what he said. He said it had been better if my mama would have miscarried. He said, oh, he said, oh, the misery and the heart and a heartbreak. It would have been better if I hadn't been born. I'd rather not have all this than to lose it. Oh, but brother, listen, he came to a place where he was sorry. Listen, that's the only way you'll get right with God and get things patched up, fixed up, and then right with God. And let me get your peace and your joy and all that stuff you're supposed to have. You've got to reach a place of remorse where you're sorry about some things. If you ever get to that place, brother, the Bible said, burn offerings thou hast not required but a broken spirit. Listen, God don't require you to do no great thing. Just come up here and lay on this altar with a broken heart and say, God, I'm sorry. It's me. It's me. I'm the one that did it. I'm the one that did wrong. Listen, he found that place of remorse. Not only that, he found out it was a place of repentance. When you see what you are and you make a turnaround, Job 42, the Bible said, God answered, the Lord answered him and said, I know that thou canst do everything. Job answered the Lord, and that no thought can be withholding from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak, I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. Listen to what he said. I have heard of thee by the hearing of my, the ear, but now my eyes see it. Behold, I bore myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job said, I come to a place of repentance. He said, God, if I've sinned against you, if this is brought on me because of something I did wrong, I repent. I, God, I ask forgiveness. Brother, listen, I want to tell you something. There's nothing in this world like good old fashioned Bible, heart repentance. There's people who need to repent to God and there's people who need to repent to somebody else. It's funny people come to the altar and pray for God to forgive them and they're mad at somebody across the aisle. Or they're mad at their wife. 
or they're mad at their husband. They can't speak to each other. I'll tell you something. Listen, you listen to me real good. You young people, I, I don't know who I'm talking to, but if you've got a little out in your heart, you've got a little old something, a little thing about the size of a BB, and you, you're just not going to speak and you're not going to be friends. Hey, you better get that thing straightened out because that thing will stay in you and it'll turn into cancer. It'll turn into bitterness. It'll mess your life up. It'll follow you to your grave. There'll come a day you'll say to God, I wish to God I repented of that mess because it ain't worth it. It ain't worth carrying that around all in years. Place of repentance. I remember, I don't know why I'm saying this, but I remember my grandpa when he died, he's 90 years old. I had an uncle that wouldn't speak to him. I don't know what his problem was. Never did know. But he's mad at grandpa. Wouldn't speak. Grandpa was just, just an old man. I mean, he, But it must have been something happened years ago that I don't know about and still don't. But he wouldn't come see him. And grandpa was dying and he, and he kept asking for him. He wouldn't go see him. He was a hot shot. He was a, he was a you know, smart elk. He's young. And he was a gambler and all that stuff. He thought he was all that in a bag of chips. That old 90-year-old shriveled up old man didn't mean nothing to him. Let him die. He didn't care. But I'll tell you what. I was just a little boy about 10 years old, Brother Jeff. And I remember when my big, bad, tough uncle walked through that back door of the church that day at his funeral. you never seen a man in that shape. There's a little old shrivel up. Them Wilcox was a bald head and had big noses. You could spot him laying there in that coffin. But when his son come walking up that hall, he about couldn't make it to the coffin, though, Sam. He collapsed three or four times. He laid across that coffin. And he cried and he wailed. I'd never seen nothing quite like that. I just sat there like any little boy with my eyes about that big. And he was saying, oh, God, Daddy, Daddy, please forgive me. I'm so sorry. It wasn't worth it, Daddy. It didn't mean nothing. I'm sorry, but Daddy couldn't hear him. Are you listening to what I'm saying this morning? I'm talking about old-fashioned Bible repentance. I'm talking about getting right with God. Get right with your wife. Get right with your husband. Get right with your preacher. Get right with your choir leader. Somebody did something to you that turned your nose, beat you out of shape. Bless God Almighty. You better get right with God for that thing ruins your life. It'll mess you up, I'm telling you. That man laid a great, big, tough, I mean rough and tough, man laid across that casket and cried like a little tiny baby. Never got no help. Place of repentance. Number three, he went in those ashes because it was a place of relief. <laughs> I'm glad for those ashes. I've been to those ash piles before. And it's a place of relief. I'm not saying you go to that place where there's a pile of ashes, that place of worship, that altar. I'm not saying you go there and everything's just magically fixed. But I am saying this. Somehow, some way, laying down on that altar, you'll get relief. I can't explain it. I mean, I, I can't, I, I can't really, I can't put it in the words. I can't tell you, but you can get up and walk away from there. It's like the brother talked about the other night. You can come up here on this altar and you can have cancer and you can pray and get relief and walk away and still have cancer. But something's different inside of here. God will give you some relief. There's been times I've had burdens and I've prayed and I've said this. I've said, God, I'm not asking you to fix the problem. Just give me a little bit of relief. God, just ease the pain a little bit. God, just give me the grace to take it. God, just give me just a little bit. Of, just help me. God, just lift a little bit of it off. Take a teaspoon off of me. God, you don't have to take the burden. You don't have to fix it. God, just give me some relief. Help me to bear it. God, this is what i got to live with. Help me to take it. God, give me some relief this morning. Just simple trust. Job said in Job 13, I love this. Verse 15, he said, he said somebody said, now what are you going to do, Job? Your God's so good. You know what he said? He said he took your kids, took your house, took your camels, took your sheep. Your wife lost her mind. Took everything you got and left you there, took your health, and you're sitting on a pile of blood and pus and a pile of ashes. Job said this, even if he kills me, I'll still trust him. He said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. He said, if this is what takes me out, I'm going to go out of here shouting. Hey, brother, I want to tell you something. Old brother Job had something that the 21st century Christian does not have. He had a relationship with God that's far beyond anything you and I can understand. He said, though he slay me. Job, I thought you left your life. He said, we can have it too. Simple trust. It's funny that they sung that song this morning. When Brother Sam started singing that song, I showed Debbie my outline. I typed this in my outline this morning. Years I spent in vanity and pride. 
Carry not, my Lord was crucified. No, no. It was for me he died. And Calvary, thank God. Mercy there was grace. And grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. Man, my burden so found liberty. And Calvary, thank God. I'm glad there's relief at the foot of the cross. Go to that pile of ashes. Thank God get what you need for the Lamb of God this morning. The place of relief. I know that where I got relief as a young man when I got saved. I've been getting relief there ever since. Amen. Sometimes I'm by myself. Sometimes I'm with my wife. Sometimes me and the boys. Sometimes me and Brother Sam. Sometimes it's the deacons. Sometimes it's Travis or Ronnie. But we'll get out and we'll find that relief at the same spot that I found it as a 20-year-old young man that had a heavy heart and a broken life and no future whatsoever. And the darling Lamb of God took up His residence deep down in my soul. Thank God. Place relief. Number four, he found it was a place of reconciliation. Maybe, maybe your problem this morning, and my problem, is that we just need to hook back up with the Lord like we used to be. You know what the best marriage counseling in the world is? You don't have to go to college to learn how to be a marriage counselor. Just tell them this. You remember what y'all did when y'all was dating? Uh huh. Keep doing it. Amen. That's all there's to it. Remember how you used to court her, take her flowers, and give her candy, open the door for her, and be top sweet to her, tell her how pretty she was. Keep doing it, brother. Hey, you know how to keep the married honey in the honeymoon. Keep telling him how good looking he is, and how strong he is, and how smart he is. Keep cooking his favorite meal and loving on him. And brother, I'll tell you, you have so much honeymoon, you'll have to run the kids off so you can be alone. I didn't know their kids were nearly grown. It all you got to do is start smooching, they'll run away. We used to have to pawn them off on people so we could be alone. Now we figured it out. It took us all these years. We will start kissing and smooching, man. They'd run jumping out windows. You'd think the house is on fire. It is. <laughs> man, I know God. Thanks, <laughs> bro. Thou knowest. Thou knowest, hey, man, brother. I'm telling you. <laughs> You talk about reconciliation. I'm talking about, brother, keeping things like it's supposed to be between me and God and keeping things right between you and God. Brother, you'll find that that pile of ashes. You may come to the end of the road and you may hit a wall, hit dead on and can't go anywhere else. But you'll find reconciliation. Again, when a man and his wife, you know when a man and his wife can really reconcile, it usually don't happen until something real bad happens. And they hit rock bottom and are this close to a divorce or murder. Me and Debbie's never discussed divorce. We've discussed murder numerous times. But when they hit rock bottom and all of a sudden it hits them, oh no, this is really going to happen. We really might get a divorce. What's going to happen to my baby? What's going to happen to these boys? What's going to happen to these little girls? What are we going to do? My God, you start thinking about it. It hits them. Then they come to you and say, Preacher, we're in a mess. We need help. When they get to that point, they've reached that pile of ashes. Job didn't. He never prayed like he prayed when he was in that pile of ashes. I guarantee you, but those things came back to his mind that he hadn't thought about in years when he sat there in that pile of ashes and them sores running all over him and everything he got, everything he loved was gone in one day. This didn't happen over a period of time. Job didn't get a chance to brace himself for it. It just happened. And when a married couple gets to the point, it's just... And I've had, I know lots of people. They'll tell you, they'll say, you know what, it's better now than it used to be. You know why? They hooked back up, brother. They got to that pile of ashes and they said, Reckon's out. He looked at her and said, I don't want no other woman. You're the one I want. She looks at him and says, I don't never want no other man but you. And whatever it was that happened, it made them start parting ways. Brother, they realized it wasn't worth it. And they start reconciling. They start coming back together. That's what I want to happen to me and God. I want to get closer to God so God will get closer to me. I don't want something between me and Him that's going to hinder by His relationship. I don't want nothing to hinder the power of God. I don't want nothing to hinder the choir. I don't want nothing to hinder the, hinder the deacon board or the Sunday school teachers or the bus ministry. But I don't want everything to be right and clear and clean between us and God. The reconciliation. 
a place of remorse, repentance, relief, reconciliation. But lastly, he found a place of restoration. Boy, ain't it good to be restored. Job 5, 17 said, Behold, happy is the man whom God corrected. Therefore despise thou not the chastening of the Almighty. For he maketh sore and bindeth up. He woundeth that his hands make whole. He shall deliver thee in six troubles, yea, in seven there shall no evil touch thee. Job said he'll restore you. Job is saying this, I found something and it didn't happen overnight. Don't think that you're going to go to the altar and say a quick prayer and God's going to put it in the microwave and the next day it's all of a sudden so it Sometimes it don't happen that way. It could happen that way. Sometimes it does. But it don't always. I ought to read the end of the story while he comes to the piano. Those pla- that place of ashes, that pile of ashes, my, my, my. Job 42, verse 10, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Remember those thousands of sheep? Twice that many. All them camels, twice as many. Verse 12, The Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, and 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 she asses. He had also seven sons and three daughters. It tells them their name, and it's in verse 15, In all the land were no women found so fair as the daughters of Job, and their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. After this, Job lived Job in 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. See, that wasn't the end of Job. If you'd have walked by and saw that mess, you'd say, that's the end of that. That's the end of the picture for that dude. So Job died being old and full of days. So what you think the end might not be the end. If you had met Job and somebody said, don't you meet somebody, check out this guy. And took you to his house, and that's where his house used to be for it. Or the or his son's house used to be for it. The wind knocked it down, that's where all his kids got killed. And that's where all his asses and camels used to graze and all the, the grounds they ain't no good now. There ain't, no, ain't no critters around here, nowhere, no livestock. He ain't got no kids. Ain't no grandkids running around to play. That's where there's the swing set. And, and uh, everything's all burned up over yonder. And, and you'd have seen Job sitting there in that pile of ashes, all them bulls and sickly looking. You know he didn't eat. You know he didn't get nourishment like he should have, but he, he survived. If you had walked by, you know what you'd have said? Same thing I would. I wouldn't give you a nickel for his chances. But as the years went by, the Bible said when the Lord blessed him again, and them kids started being born all over again, Said he had the most beautiful daughters in the whole entire land. Everybody said them girls, that's juicy that baby doll. You know who's young than that is, don't you? Remember old Job? That's his daughter. You got to be kidding. You mean after all that happened to him? Yeah, after all that. He sat, sat in that pile of ashes, but God restored him. Amen. Remember the story of Naomi and Elimelech went down to Moab because there's no bread in Bethlehem. They went down to Moab and her husband died, but she stayed. She should have hightailed it back. They left Bethlehem and thought she was going to starve to death. But she stayed, and her, and her sons, Malon and Chilion, married girls, and they died, and she had two daughter-in-laws, and she left one, Orpah was her name, I think, and took Ruth back with her to Bethlehem. Here's the point of that whole story. When she got back to Bethlehem, there's still people there. They didn't have to leave. They sojourned. They said, let's go down there. I heard this bread in Moab. They should have just stayed. Because when they got to Bethlehem, you know what they were doing? People were still working. Hauling grain, raising wheat, raising barley. People's working. People's going out. They didn't die after all. So here's my point. You might think this is the end of the line. I'm dead. I'm gone. I'm washed up. It's all over. I'm done. No, you ain't. If Job survived it and got restored, I think me and you can survive it. I think God can restore me and you. Listen, as a preacher, there's been times I thought my ministry is over. Really. There's been times we've had, we've had church trouble and church problems. I thought, man, I'm washed up. Is it? I'm done. Stick a fork in me, buddy. I'm through. But you know what? He wasn't done. He ain't done, so I ain't done. He'll bring us to that place of restoration. Let's stand this morning.